Okay. Most of you found I uh, were okay with the assignments. It's very straightforward. We're going to find out. You're going to find out. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's a, I mean, to be honest, with the assignments and data analysis, uh, it's really it's more how you how you think and how you're proceeding with with, uh, with the analysis. And there's in many cases, yeah, sure, there's right and wrong answers for some of the easier stuff. But as you go on, it's it's more a lot of it's interpretation and how you're thinking that's that's much more interesting. So uh, what what I've done here is I uh, just opened the data set during the break, and I uh, just to recap here, I excluded the last 84 points. You are all comfortable with excluding the data. Uh, we did that in the last class, so I won't go over that again. And uh, built a model. Autofit gives four components. Uh, very good predictions there. Uh, the first component, let's just take a look, create a table, 93%, 95%, 97%, is what it's giving you. But the first problem you notice in the score space is obviously these two, two observations out here. That uh, seems to be quite unusual. So we've got 100 data points. We expect one data point to be outside the Hotelling's T-squared ellipse. Here we've got two. So that one's pretty close, but this one is, is huge. Okay, so on a, most of the, the scores, if you look at the T1 value, range between plus and minus four, okay, from the T1 perspective. This particular data point here has a T1 value up at about plus eight. This one has a value of close to 25. So what happened here is this point, we say, has extremely high leverage. It basically uh, pulled the whole model towards itself. And you can see that, actually, if you plot the square prediction error. So go to SPE plot that with four components, that data point has one of the lowest SPEs, it's right down here, zero. So that point is on the model plane. Okay. So this point up here, and I highlighted there in red, is on the model plane. It's got no, no prediction error. Because it's such a huge outlier, it's biased the whole model plane to it pulled it towards itself. It's the case um, the linear regression equivalent of building a linear regression model where you've got your data points doing this, but you've got one outlier like that, and so the least squares fit goes like this. Okay, that point has got zero residual. It's just leveraged the whole the whole line to, towards itself, so this point has zero error, but really you're obviously putting a nonsensical regression here because the true relationship between these two variables is that. Okay, so it's the, exactly the same same concept. SPE is, is next to zero for that data point. The other data point, um, I don't, let's take a look if we've got SPE up there. Yeah, so both those data points here are very low square prediction error. Uh, indicating that they pulled the model towards themselves. So the first thing to do, rather than just blindly deleting them, just select it, generate the contribution plot, and it indicates all the variables are high. And, and when you plot that in the raw data, you see that point sticks out very clearly. We, and in fact, you see it even when you import the raw data. Okay, so this was probably, I don't know this, uh, the origin of this data, but that was probably a, a data recording error. Maybe everything was uh, off by order of magnitude, or someone recalibrated the sense at that period of time. I'm not entirely sure what the reason for it is, but it's definite that that's an outlier. Um, the other data point is, if you get the contribution for that, is, is similar. Um, not all the other variables are high, but mostly G8 is high. So if you select that variable and you use the raw data plot, um, that, that, that's G8 for that variable. For that particular observation. So definitely those two observations need to be excluded and rebuild the model. So I did that over here. Um, most of you know, I guess, or you've discovered, there's this exclude icon over here. So you can just click on that garbage can and it will delete those two data points and rebuild, create a new model for you down here that you can uh, go ahead and build. So that's what, that's what model two is. Okay, so now n is equal to 98 in this case. I used auto fit, four components. First component explains 94% of the variation in the data set. The next component, uh, 
Sorry, sorry, 78. 78, sorry, I was reading the total. 78, then an additional 6, 5, and then 4. Okay, so there's the score plot and SPE. And the, and the assignment question asked, we're now roughly at question five, where you've excluded the outliers. Question six, did you get all the outliers? Check the scores, SPE. What did it, anyone say here? No more scores, uh, no more outliers? Yeah. Which one is that? SPE. That one is the violating SPE. Yeah. But it's one data point out of 100. <laughs> One data point out of 98, okay. So, it, but see, I, I personally, I wouldn't necessarily mean that, take that to be an outlier, but I haven't investigated it yet. So, yeah, I was, I said, like, you know, there's already five points between 95 and 99. I have the sixth one there, so I said, you know, okay. yeah, well, it could be a, a good judgment. Uh, on, a, on, a very, on a very large data set, you get, you get a couple of these, and sometimes it's, it's not one out of a hundred, it's, it's 1.3 out of a hundred that you notice uh, above the limit. So you can't really say it's an outlier until you've investigated it. So let's let's do that. Um, uh, we highlight that point. So here's a case where this point has got a high SPE, but it's within the model space. So it projects very close to the model center. It's just far off the plane, is what that interpretation says. Uh, we plot the contributions for it. Okay, maybe this is an outlier, right? It's showing a very clear signal in G9 and G6. What is it in G9 and G6? Uh, we can go plot those two variables. Pretty hard to see it here on this univariate plot. So I'm going to plot G9 against G6. Did anyone plot the two variables against each other? Yeah. Yeah. What, what does it show up? Does it show up as being very different? Not too much. Okay. Let's take a look. Um, X variables. So it's, it's somewhat different. I mean, it's not not that far off, but the, clearly the trend is that, and then that points over there, which is again why it's it's just above the SPE limit. If it was any further, the further that point goes away from this general relationship, the higher and higher the SPE value is going to become, indicating that that point has an inconsistent correlation structure that doesn't match the rest of the data. Okay, that's clear. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, sure, go ahead and remove it. Let's take a look what happens then. Uh, we delete it, say OK. Uh, that was 0.67, you said? Yeah. OK. So, auto fit, all components, roughly the same amount of variation. Yeah, things haven't changed by very much. You're still 78% for the first component. 6.5% for the second. That's another indicator to me that the model hasn't changed by much, is an indication that it probably wasn't biasing the model by a whole lot by keeping that point in or out. So that's again, I was speaking during the break and so on. It's something that kind of comes with experience. Delete a point, refit the model, and you compare, have the loadings changed? Have the patterns in the score plot changed? If they have changed a whole lot, that indicates that that point was influencing the model to some extent. If the model is roughly the same afterwards, we could have left it in either way. Yeah. Can you check the SPE, uh, the SPE versus the gravity squared plot? Absolutely. Because when I got that, there are a lot of points like for which, model two. Uh, for yeah, for the last one, it doesn't matter. Okay, so analyze SP versus T squared. Use all four components. Okay. Because what we said in class last time that the first square is like the normal weight, and then. Get the shift from the of the square and 95% of our points should lie within this region. A couple of points up here, a couple of points up here, where you really don't want to be 
there's high SP and high T squared, and we don't have any of those points now. There's that point with high SP, high, that's what we're talking about. High T squared, and then, so high SPE on this axis, and then here we've got two data points with high T squared. Okay, those are two interesting points I didn't pick up earlier. Um, actually, let's, well, I, I didn't pick those up earlier, I see why, because earlier I was plotting T1 versus T2. Okay, so from T1, T2's perspective, there are no outliers, but I really didn't go investigate T3, T4, okay. Yeah, because, yeah, this would have been this way, but what, what's the definition if you got more than 5% outside of 95% of the zero? Some of those are outliers. Well, yeah, because we actually, when we, when we finish given the number from 67, if we check T1 versus T2, we have more than five points outside the T1 to T2. Okay. If you remove one of them, you'll get like 18 data points by T1. Coming in. Okay, so you're raising a good point. It's like, when do you stop? Do you just keep delete, 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 and refit? Well, no. You have to you have to use your, your head a bit. I, I can go delete that and refit, and I can go delete these and refit, but what I should go do is I should go investigate the raw data for this. Is that really an outlier? Or is it just naturally there because it's slightly higher than normal? Okay? Um, the, the software actually provides a tool for you that will automatically go remove observations with high SP and T squared. And I'm kind of reluctant to show it to you because people then just use that without ever going to investigate the reason for the point being an outlier. So that being said, I'll show you the tool. Um, it's up here, I think. I won't show it to you. If you find it, you can you can play around with it. But basically, what the tool does is that it automatically takes points with high T squared and high SP and deletes them. So the model and then active model. Okay, the model, active model. Okay, yeah. So there's the very uh, observation pruning. And so you can go say, if hotelling's T squared is above the 95% limit, and if SPE is above this 95% limit. You can search for those observations. So you hit search. And in this case, it doesn't find any. And how can you say all? Oh, any observ any criteria to search. So it goes and finds the observations which meet. In this case, this observation met the hotel T squared criteria. This observation met the SPE criteria. And the observations that meet both criteria will have both of those markings. But, and then you can go click those and delete them, but that's not really what you should be doing. What you should go do is say, well, okay, here's that point over here, and let me generate a contribution plot. So that's, that point's an outline that in Vitalis T squared analyze, Vitalis T squared four components. There's that point over here, get a contribution for it, and go, let's go take a look at, at variable G7, okay? Now you can ask yourself, from G7's point of view, is that point an outline? It's kind of high compared to the rest of the data. There's another point that's of similar magnitude, but it plus 1.2, there's points that are roughly minus 1.5. So if this variable is normally distributed, your range is plus or minus 1.5, that's really not so bad. And that's why I say don't just arbitrarily go click and exclude, click and exclude, click and exclude. Um, what you will do, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up just depleting your data set. You'll go remove, remove observation after observation and have nothing left. Okay? So there, there comes a point where you where you have to you have to really question the data every time you rebuild the model. So in this case, I would be reluctant to remove that point. And it, in fact, it may not change the model by a whole lot. It, even if I did go through it. Uh, this data point over here, um, so where's my T squared plot? Let's just go get the contribution for that other one. Okay, so here's, I can go investigate these variables G6 and G8 for that data point. Again, not too extreme. G8, I'll uh, take a look at it as well. 
So no, I would say that points a t, a t squared outlier maybe just because of uh, slight change, slight changes in the third and fourth components. But then again, that third and fourth components are not explaining a whole lot of variation. Okay, if we go plot t three versus t four. Versus four. Okay, so that's those that points are coming from these outliers. Outliers in the third component and in the fourth component, you could argue, are less less important because the third component only explains five percent of the variation. The fourth component explains only three percent of the variation. So when you interpret the score plot, you have to have that context in mind as well. That Sure, it's an outlier from the perspective of T4, but T4 is your smallest component, only explaining about 4%. Okay, so, probably not that big of a deal. And it, and it wouldn't change the model if you excluded it if you built it. Okay. So, I would, I would stop either after removing 0.67 or, or not. Either way, you could, you, could, um, you could answer that. Either way, there's no, no particular issue there. Um, question. The next question asks, what is your interpretation of the first component? Yes, sir. So the, the, the first plot for that two points, the weight of the bottom plot for the, the high and the high length, uh, probably one and a half, high length, we will find some point is a break the relationship. Well, the, that point showed up on the SPE, I think. Yeah, that's a, a two point. Okay. Uh, so which, this one that I've got highlighted right now? Uh, just for the 23 and 21, that's your point. 23 uh, and 21. Yeah. That's, that leads two? Yeah. And, and if you plot, okay, so you're saying if you plot custom plot, custom plot you know which two variables? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, actually, contribution. Okay, uh, contribution to SP. Okay, so I would I would say it's a it's an outlier it's unusual if it showed up in SPE. If it if it did break the relationship inside the raw data, but it doesn't show up in SPE, it indicates that those two variables that would be a weird situation. I think then those two variables have low weighting in your model, but in this case all the variables are equaling, so I'm not sure how you would get that situation. Um, I just want to check here quickly though. What Okay, just one thing while before I, I, I answer that. If you go and generate a contribution plot for any of the data points below the limit, you'll always see large contributions. You'll always see something there, right? So here, for example, if I go select this data point here and I generate the contribution plot for it, it's, it's clearly below the limit. It's not something you would normally generate the contribution for. But if I do go ahead, it shows up variable G4 and G9, okay? And you can go investigate it and you might notice some small relationship that's unusual between G4 and G9. But you shouldn't interpret anything about it. Any point below SPE or below T squared or within the score space that you go generate a contribution plot for will always have one or two bars that are really big compared to the others. But it, it's a nonsensical plot to generate in the first place, okay? There's no sense in looking at a contribution plot from a point that's inside the limits. You always see a pattern, you may see something there, but it's not going to be a meaningful uh, pattern to look at. Um, it starts to become more meaningful the closer that point gets to the limits or beyond the limits. But a point that's close down here, sure, you're going to see a pattern, but it's not going to be that helpful. Okay. Uh, no, I'm just we, have we explicitly like, discussed how that contribution is being calculated? Uh, I have a few slides in it though. I'd much rather go through some data sets today than cover the topic. I, I can certainly come back to it yeah. in a later class, but um, it's, it is in, the, in today's notes. I plan to cover it if we have time. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, meaning of, of the first component, P1. Baba, do you have? The, the interpretation of the of the first component. So it, it had almost a uniform thickness at all the points. 
Okay, so how would you interpret uh, what what is T1 showing? A high value of T1, let's it's say. It's showing the it's showing how fast the data is explained. So it, it would be like a uniform thickness, but it is thick. It's thick. So a high T1 value is, is a, th a thick wafer, and a low T1 value would be thin. thin wafer, right? So the first component really is describing the thickness at all locations uniformly, as you said. So it's the, 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 basically it's the average thickness of the wafer. And a high T1 value is a thick wafer, a low T1 value is a thin wafer. If your P1 loadings were just flipped the other way, it would still be the same interpretation. It's just um, you'd have a low T1 would be a thick wafer, and a positive T1 would be a thin wafer, but you'd still get the same, same meaning there. Okay, so P1, T1 really shows the average thickness to, uh, on the wafer. Um, and given the R squared value for that first component, what would you say about this process and, and its variability? No, you think so? <laughs> how much how much variability is explained by the first component? So seventy nine percent is roughly explained by the first component. It's, what is that indicating about the variability of the process overall? What is most of the variation in the process due to? 79% of the variation is due to the overall thicknesses of the wafers just going up or down. Imagine if you could, remember we're coming back to this idea of process monitoring and controlling our processes. Ideally, we've got some target thickness we'd like to aim for. Okay, some average thickness that must be our specification for our process. We'd like to produce a silicon wafer so that when we send it to the next step in the processing facility, it, it, it's within the targets. But we're saying 80% of our variation is just due to our inability to get the thickness flat. We're not able to get flat line. Okay. We're getting the overall thickness is either too big, too thick, or too thin, and 80% of that variation in our process is due to that problem. Okay, If we could magically install a feedback controller, train our operators, buy new equipment that were able to reduce the variability of, or be able to control or get the average thickness lower and more consistent, we would be able to eliminate about 80% of the, at most, 80% of the variation. So say at most, 80% of the variation in this process is just due to our inability to be able to control the thickness. Okay. And we may have, it may not be uh, cost effective to buy a new piece of equipment, but we may be able to use better feedback control or train our operators who are running this, this system to try and bring that variation down. So instead of operating over this full range, we would ideally like to be able to operate of a much smaller range of variation. Okay, that would be, would be the ideal case. But right now, oh, from a whole data set's perspective, 80% of the variation is just due to uh, the average thickness problem. Yeah, perfect. Perfect, man. Okay, so, uh, this, um, so my thought here is, what if you had a process where you don't really actually care about your average thickness, and you just care about thickness overall? So is it a valid thing to do that to say, um, throw away the first component, don't even worry about it. Right. Or is that is there a better way to approach that? No, you're absolutely right. If if the average thickness is, is totally a non issue from a quality point of view, you would just ignore the first component. But at least you've recognized that eighty percent of my variation is due to that problem. Now you can focus on the rest, the six percent, the five percent, and the three percent, and try to identify what those mean. And maybe those are problems. But remember, each component's orthogonal to the other. So, so right, that's what I'm about to say. No, it's like if you're doing it that way, then then it, it just happens that there's some other correlation that's getting caught up in that. 
Yeah. So it might be better not to do that at all. Yeah, you might just ignore T1 and then monitor T2, T3, T4. Ignore a monitoring chart of T1 because you're saying average thickness doesn't affect my process quality, but you need to prove that to yourself with your manager. But once you prove that and you're happy with that assumption, you can say, well, I just need to monitor T2, T3, and S2. If that was what you wanted to do, would it be better off then to actually assess it first, loading deliberately, so that you were talking about one-to-one -one correlation? So, like, see what I'm saying? So, if you say the loading to one, two. So, like, so if you really didn't care about the uh, the amount that everything was very and you got, yeah, it's just, I could force my first um, loading to be in a direction that that would only account for everything. Moving well, in this case, what you could quite simply do is calculate your mean thickness, subtract it from the data, <laughs> for and then just rebuild the model. Yeah. That would be yeah. Like, yeah. identical. But it's what you what basically what you're saying is this. You're saying, I don't want to monitor T1. So I'm going to say x is equal to T1 P1 transpose plus yeah. T2 P2 transpose. Yeah. You're saying, instead of monitoring that, I'm going to monitor x minus T1 P1 transpose. Right is equal to the rest, and then you want to just those. So you first subtract off the part that you don't care about, this major source of variation, yeah. and then monitor the rest. And you'll sometimes see that. We talked about earlier monitoring Hotelling's T-squared. And remember the definition for Hotelling's T-squared is T-squared is equal to T1 divided by its variance plus T2 divided by its variance so on, up to the last component. If knowing that T1 is, is a nuisance variation and it's not affecting the quality of your process, you don't have to include that term in your hotel's T squared calculation. Just delete it, calculate T squared on the other components and monitor that new, new pseudo T squared. And that happens in many processes. I've seen that in many companies they'll do that. They'll say T1, because PCA captures the major source of variation, captures things like their throughput. Yeah. The fact that in winter you're producing less product than in summer in some places. Or because there's a higher demand in summer for your product to you, a petroleum plant, you, you increase your throughput in the summer times and you drop throughput in the winter time. But if you're building a monitoring model, the first major source of variation is that throughput variation, but it's meaningless. You, you know in summer I'm producing more product, in winter I'm producing less. You don't want that to show up in your alarms, in your, in your monitoring plant. So, Build your model, leaving that in, but you monitor on the subsequent scores. You put that in because you know you want that to be captured in SPE as well. So your, model, your SPE still has the first component, but it's deleted that out. So you still want to capture when this when this problem happens. The problem did happen. If you're moving away from that model, like if, the, the, if that correlation isn't being maintained, where you still, still want to catch it. So, a lot of flexibility with weight invariant models from the monitoring point. Um, T, T2 and P2, what, is that, what was the meaning of that? Yana? Yeah, it's just like, it's like the remaining And in this particular data set, was there any meaning you could put on P2? No. No? I guess a few people that are disagreeing with you. <laughs> I feel that way. Like if you looked at the diagram and then saw which numbers were acting in a certain way, it showed that the thickness, in one of the cases where the thickness on the outside was greater than the thickness on the inside. OK, so there's P2 as a bar plot for, for the second component. Um, and the diagram. Yeah, uh, what's interesting is these loadings are negative and these loadings are positive. Okay, and positions one, two, three, four, and five are all the interior positions on the on the wafer. They're on the inside S uh, six, seven, and eight. And especially eight are on the outside. Nine doesn't show up at all, or very little. So one way of of, of describing the second component is that it's the kind of the curvature almost of the disk. Okay, so the inside, what would, well, let's put it this way, what would a low value of P2 look like? Uh, if you had a, ne sorry, what would a, a negative T2 value look like? Thick on the inside, thick on the inside. Okay, so looking at, at the disk from the side, 
uh, kind of like that. Okay, and a, and a positive T two would be the opposite, where it'd be sort of concave. That's just exaggerated. Okay. So the first component is is capturing how thick and thin you are overall. The second component is capturing the curvature of the of the disk. Okay. So you could have a you could easily have a disk with high T one and high T two values. A disk with high T one and high T two is just a thicker disk. Okay. So this has got high T one and high T two, and a disk with high T1 but negative T2 would just be, again, it's overall it's a thicker disk, but it's still got curvature. Okay, so this would be plus T1 and negative T2. Okay. And, and those two components are orthogonal to each other, so you can, you can interpret that independently of each other. But this curvature is only 6.5% uh, of the variation of the data set. Was there on this assignment? Um, okay, I asked you to plot uh, any patterns in T1. Did you notice any patterns in this first score as, as a line plot? Not too many. No. I think uh, yeah. So uh, and then in the second component, anything interesting in the second component? I found that a lot of them were below the center. Yeah. Uh, if you plot the, if you plot T2, you go to model uh, to analyze. Uh, custom plot, and then you choose range. Oh, sorry, T as your variable. Choose T two, and you, you ask to plot as a line plot. Say, okay, um, you need a scatter plot. I just want to put oh, T two as a line plot. But you're referring to the fact that this up here. Uh, I, I I did a scatter plot first. For T one, T two, okay. Yeah, is that what you're referring to? Uh, just one like time series for T1 or time series for T2, you notice that the variation for T1 is along, like, so you have some points above T, the, the, the center line and some points below, but for T2, you have all of them are below, so there's not that much. Okay, so yeah, here I've got the plot for T2. You can see a lot of the points are below, especially here at the front, yeah. which is unusual because we normally expect the points to be roughly evenly distributed either way. But for these first roughly 20 observations, you've got negative T2s indicating you're producing mostly wafers that are of this type. Okay, and that's unusual. Um, it may be that, or, or it may not be unusual, right? It might may be just that the operator that's running the process is running it for all those batches and he or she is trained in a certain way and is manufacturing the wafers so that they come out like this. Then his or her shift ends, and another operator takes over who tends to be all over the map. See how this period of time, there's much greater variation in the thickness of uh, that curvature of the disk. And then someone else comes back and takes over for a period of time and they're producing consistently curved disks. And then the next operator comes back online again, producing all over the map. Okay, so you can interpret the series patterns that way. The pattern that I, I, I realized you didn't pick it up in T1 was because I asked you to build the data set, to build the model on the first 100 and 100 points. But the, the, main, the pattern actually shows up in the later data points, so you didn't pick up the pattern that I was thinking to pick up. Um, uh, and we can actually look at it next, where we now bring in all the data set and plot those as testing data. And what we want to see is, do we pick up the outliers we excluded originally? So, go here to, uh, what is it? Uh, edit, prediction sets. We want to create a new prediction set. Okay, and all the data included in that. So now if you go to analyze and you say um, score plot, well let's, let's actually plot the Vitalik's t-squared plot first. So Vitalik's t-squared plot on 
all the data using four components. Okay. So if we were monitoring our process, we're clearly picking up that unusual two observations we deleted when we uh, that we excluded earlier. We're also picking up two problems over there. And of the remaining 100 data points, this one and that one, and, and, and one or two others get, get picked up. Okay, so from a monitoring perspective, it's good. We're seeing our bad data points that we know are bad being picked up again. We're picking up one or two others and we can go and investigate those. Um, and for example, this one over here, you have highlighted and you go look at the contributions. And what's interesting about those contributions over there, Harry? So this contribution to the to the hotel into T squared. Hotel into T squared. So it's all four components. Anything you notice about that contribution point that seems kind of unusual? It's the first, major, main, mainly the first five variables showing up. So it's the problem with this. But this particular wafer is due to the five inside thickness positions. Okay. And we can go plot those five positions, the raw data for it, so it's observation roughly 111. Okay, so plot, plot them over here. So observation 100 and let's give a second, let's put it on order. Oh wait, I see what it's done. Okay, the black is the train data, the green is that is all my data, so that's why I've suddenly got 200 and some data points. Okay, so, huh, yeah, uh, okay, I can see what it's done. Put your train data first, and then remember my testing data sets all 184, so I've got 198 plus 184 here. So this is gonna make it tough to find, oh, okay, wait, point, 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 point 110. So that's over here. The contribution plots I generate on those points over here, over here, and over here. So they've got uh, thicker positions at G1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, but the contribution didn't show us the other locations. So that's the, that's the Hotelling's T squared on the testing data. Let's just take a look at SPE on the testing data. Okay, so here's my Here's my training set, and I pick up, I think that's the point 67 that I deleted earlier, right? And then you go pick up another, this other point. I think that's the same point I just saw earlier. Uh, this one over here, so that's that one over there. And then the point's 150 some. I think the uh, near, near points like for the SP, I think 155 and 118 or something. Oh, okay, 118, yeah, that's, that's, that's this one. Okay, so it's not the same one as that. Okay, yeah, so two new points show up on the SPE monitoring chart that we didn't pick up on this on the on the other monitoring chart. And that makes sense, right? Because the SPE chart is, is measuring, is showing you independent information to the T squared chart. And you could go contribution plots. Seems to be a problem between positions two, three, four, and five, some inconsistency over there. We could certainly go investigate that on the raw data, but I will see that for now. Um, and then again, other data points. Okay. So that seems to be a problem with the consistency between points G6 and G9. And you could go verify that. Okay, so most of you are nodding your heads. This seems to be pretty straightforward and, and you've got the general concept, which is good. Um, let's take a, a five five, six minute break and we come back and then I'll, I'll uh, show you some examples of process monitoring and then we'll look at some data sets after.